Sri Aurobindo once said about the mother, The one whom we adore as the mother is the divine conscious force that dominates all existence. One and yet so many-sided that to follow her movement is impossible even for the quickest mind and for the freest and most vast intelligence. The Mother is the consciousness and force of the Supreme and far above all she creates. The mother herself remarked, There is only one thing of which I am absolutely sure, and that is who I am. Sri Aurobindo also knew it and declared it. Even the doubts of the whole of humanity would change nothing to this fact. Throughout all this life, knowingly or unknowingly, I have been what the Lord wanted me to be. I have done what the Lord wanted me to do. That alone matters. Explaining the mother's true status, Sri Aurobindo said, The Divine puts on an appearance of humanity, assumes the outward human nature in order to tread the path and show it to human beings, but does not cease to be the Divine. It is a manifestation that takes place a manifestation of a growing divine consciousness, not human, turning into divine. The mother was inwardly above the human, even in childhood. The mother was born on 21st February, 1878, in Paris. Named Blanche Rachel Mira Alfasa, she lived in France until 1914. When and how did I become conscious of a mission which I was to fulfill on earth? It is difficult to say when it came to me. It is as though I were born with it and following the growth of the mind and brain, the precision and completeness of this consciousness grew also. From the age of five, I was conscious that I did not belong to this world, that I did not have a human consciousness. My sadhana began at that age. There was a small chair for me on which I used to sit, still, engrossed in my meditation. A very brilliant light would then descend over my head and produce some turmoil inside my brain. Of course I understood nothing. It was not the age for understanding. But gradually I began to feel I shall have to do some tremendously great work that nobody yet knows. To the students of the Ashram school, the mother explained 
her own childhood process of introspection. You have never thought about it. You have never looked into yourself to see what effect you exercise upon yourself. Never sought to understand how, for example, decisions take place in you. From where do they come? What makes you decide one thing rather than another? You have pondered over that. I was preoccupied with that when I was a child of five. It is a rather unpleasant sensation to feel yourself pulled by the strings and made to do things whether you want to or not. That is quite irrelevant. But to be compelled to act because something pulls you by the strings, something which you do not even see, that is exasperating. However, I do not know, but I found it very exasperating, even when I was quite a child. At five it began to seem to me quite intolerable, and I sought for a way so that it might be otherwise, without people getting a chance to scold me. For I knew nobody who could help me, and I did not have the chance that you have, someone who can tell you, this is what you have to do. There was nobody to tell me that. I had to find it out all by myself. And I found it. I started at five. The mother had a brother named Matteo, who was a year and a half older than she. He grew up to become the Governor General of French Equatorial Africa. The mother's early education was given at home. She began going to school only at the age of nine. In the following statement, the mother once spoke of her inner experiences. Between 11 and 13, a series of psychic and spiritual experiences revealed to me not only the existence of God, but man's possibility of uniting with him, of realizing him integrally in consciousness and action, of manifesting him upon earth in a life divine. This, along with a practical discipline for its fulfillment, was given to me during my body's sleep by several teachers, some of whom I met afterwards on the physical plane. Later on, as the interior and exterior development proceeded, the spiritual and psychic relation with one of these beings became more and more clear and frequent. And although I knew little of the Indian philosophies and religions at that time, I was led to call him Krishna, and henceforth I was aware that it was with him whom I knew I should meet on earth one day that the divine work was to be done. The mother learned occultism at the age of 12, going out of the body into the astral worlds. I practiced occultism when I was 12. But I must say I had no fear. I feared nothing. Later, her occult knowledge saved her from serious injury. Deeply absorbed within herself, she was once crossing a boulevard in Paris. I was walking when I suddenly received a shock, as if I had received a blow, as if something had hit me and I jumped back instinctively. And as soon as I had jumped back, a tram went past. It was the tram that I had felt 
at a little more than arm's length. It had touched the aura, the aura of protection. It was very strong at that time. I was deeply immersed in occultism and I knew how to keep it. The aura of protection had been hit and that had literally thrown me backwards as if I had received a physical shock. And what insults from the driver. I jumped back just in time and the tram went by. When she was 15, the mother joined the Académie Julien in Paris to learn to sketch and paint. This well-known academy was probably the only one which conducted classes for women at the time. She studied there for four years. At the age of 19, the mother married the painter Henri Maurice. Her only son, André, was born the following year. And her inner journey continued. Between the age of 19 and 20, I had achieved conscious and constant union with the Divine Presence and... I had done so all by myself, with absolutely nobody to help me, not even books. When I found one, a little later, Vivekananda's Raja Yoga came into my hands. It seemed so marvellous that someone was able to explain something to me. It enabled me to achieve in a few months something which I might have taken years to do. Around the age of 20, the mother met an Indian in France who spoke to her about one of India's greatest scriptures, the Bhagavad Gita. He said, Read it with this, this knowledge, that... In the Gita, Krishna represents the immanent God, the God who is within you. Well, in a month, the whole work was done. In the early 1900s, the mother met the occult adepts, Max Theon and his wife. In 1906 and 1907, she visited Tlemcen, Algeria, to study occultism under them. Once, Madame Théon sent flower petals to the mother, saying they would give her protection and strength. She kept these petals in a case around her neck. Then one day, she suddenly felt depleted, as though a support had been taken away. In the evening, she discovered that all the petals had somehow fallen out. There was not one petal left. Then I really knew that they carried a considerable charge of power, for I had felt the difference without even knowing the reason. I didn't know the reason, and it made a considerable difference. So it was after this that I saw 
how one could use flowers by charging them with forces. They are extremely receptive. From 1912, the mother began to note down in her diaries the experiences she had while meditating in her room, Rue du Val de Grasse, in Paris. Most of these notes were written between 1912 and 1917. The mother made a selection of them and they were published later under the title Prayers and Meditations. Sri Aurobindo emphasized that from the beginning the mother and himself followed the same sadhana. Mother was doing yoga before she knew or met Sri Aurobindo, but the alliance of sadhana independently followed the same course. When they met, they helped each other in perfecting the sadhana. Between 1911 and 1913, the mother met small groups of seekers in Paris and gave a number of talks which later appeared in a book entitled Words of Long Ago. She was soon to embark on the fulfillment of a long cherished dream to go to India, the country as she wrote, she had always seen as a true mother country. In 1914, this joy was granted to her. On 29th March, she arrived in Pondicherry and met Sri Aurobindo. As soon as I saw Sri Aurobindo, I recognized in him the well-known being whom I used to call Krishna. And this is enough to explain why I am fully convinced that my place and my work are near him in India. It matters little that there are thousands of beings plunged in the densest ignorance. He whom we saw yesterday is on earth. His presence is enough to prove that a day will come when darkness shall be transformed into light and thy reign shall be indeed established upon earth. Nolini Kanto Gupta recalls what Sri Aurobindo said about the mother. The first time that Sri Aurobindo described her qualities, he said he had never seen anywhere a self-surrender so absolute and unreserved. On 22nd February 1915, after nearly a year's stay in Pondicherry, the mother had to return to France on account of the outbreak of the First World War. For the next five years, she remained in touch with Sri Aurobindo through correspondence. After living in France for a year, the mother went to Japan 
where she stayed from 1916 until 1920. Of this time, she later said, For four years, from an artistic point of view, I lived from wonder to wonder. Japan possesses the vitality and the concentrated energies of a nation which has not yet reached its zenith. That energy is one of the most striking features of Japan. It is visible everywhere, in everyone. I have seen many countries. In every country I lived the life of that country in order to understand it well. And there is nothing which interested me in my outer being as much as learning. Rabindranath Tagore visited Japan in 1916 and again in the following year. On both occasions, he met the mother. This photograph was probably taken in 1917. In 1920, the mother left Japan for India, reaching Pondicherry on the 24th of April. Of her arrival, Sri Aurobindo commented in a letter, The sadhana and the work were waiting for the mother's coming. I was on boat, at sea, not expecting anything. I was, of course, busy with the inner life, but I was living physically on the boat. When, all of a sudden, abruptly, about two nautical miles from Pondicherry, the quality, I may even say the physical quality of the atmosphere, of the air, changed so much that I knew we were entering the aura of Sri Aurobindo. It was a physical experience, and I guarantee that whoever has a sufficiently awakened consciousness can feel the same thing. In the early 20s, the disciples met Sri Aurobindo occasionally and used to meditate with him every afternoon. But from 1926, Sri Aurobindo began to gradually withdraw and the disciples started meditating with the mother. At first, the mother was called Mira. Then from around September 1926, she started to be called the mother. As Nolinikant Gupta recalled, In the beginning, Sri Aurobindo would refer to the mother quite distinctly as Mira. No one knows for certain on which particular date, at what auspicious moment, the word mother was uttered by the lips of Sri Aurobindo. But that was a divine moment in unrecorded time, a moment of destiny in the history of man and earth. For it was at this supreme moment that the mother was established on this material earth in the external consciousness of man. Towards the end of 1926, there was a change in the life of the community. The spiritual atmosphere in the ashram was being gradually charged with increasing power and purpose during the years 1922 
1926. And this concentration rose to a high intensity in the weeks following Shurbindo's birthday on 15th August 1926, culminating in the city of 24th November, signifying the descent of the overmental force. A.B. Purani was present on that day. He later wrote, The delight consciousness in the overmind, which Sri Krishna incarnated as avatar, descended on this day into the physical, rendering possible the descent of the supermind in matter. About the founding of the ashram, Purani noted, when Sri Aurobindo retired completely after 24th November 1926, the whole material and spiritual charge of the ashram devolved on the mother. It is for this reason that 24th November is regarded not only as the day of Sri Aurobindo's Siddhi, but also as the birthday of the Sri Aurobindo ashram. In a letter to the Maharani of Baroda in 1930, Sri Aurobindo explained the purpose of the ashram. My aim is to create a center of spiritual life which shall serve as a means of bringing down the higher consciousness and making it a power not merely for salvation, but for a divine life upon earth. It is with this object that I have withdrawn from public life and founded this ashram. On another occasion, he wrote, This ashram has been created with another object, than that ordinarily common to such institutions. Not for the renunciation of the world, but as a center and a field of practice for the evolution of another kind and form of life, which would in the final end be moved by a higher spiritual consciousness and embody a greater life of the Spirit. In a conversation in May 1956, the mother revealed, At the beginning of my present earthly existence, I came into contact with many people who said that they had a great inner aspiration an urge towards something deeper and truer. But they were tied down, subjected, slaves to that brutal necessity of earning their living. They felt imprisoned in a material necessity, narrow and deadening. I was very young at that time. And I always used to tell myself that if ever I could do it, I would try to create a little world, oh, quite a small one, but still, a small world where people would be able to live without having to be preoccupied with food and lodging and clothing and the imperative necessities of life, so as to see whether all the energies freed by this certainty of a secure material living would turn spontaneously towards the divine life and the inner realization. Well, towards the middle of my life, the means was given to me and I could realize this, that is, create 
such conditions of life. Writing about his system of yoga, Sri Aurobindo said, What is known as Sri Aurobindo's yoga is the joint creation of Sri Aurobindo and the mother. They are now completely identified. Know that the mother's light and force are the light and force of the truth. Remain always in contact with the mother's light and force. Then only can you grow into the divine truth. She has helped and is helping to give a concrete form to my yoga. This would not have been possible without her cooperation. One of the two great steps in this yoga is to take refuge in the mother. During the first few years, the ashram grew at a fast pace. Nearly all newcomers were assigned some work in one of the services that were developing. This was a brilliant and extraordinary time. As the mother later recalled, A very brilliant creation was worked out in extraordinary detail with marvellous experiences, contacts with divine beings and all kinds of manifestations which are considered miraculous. Experiences followed one upon another and, well, things were unfolding altogether brilliantly and, I must say, in an extremely interesting way. One day, I went as usual to relate to Sri Aurobindo what had been happening. We had come to something really very interesting and perhaps I showed a little enthusiasm in my account of what had taken place. Then Sri Aurobindo looked at me and said, Yes, this is an overmind creation. It is very interesting, very well done. And then he smiled and said, It will be a great success. But it is an overmind creation. And it is not success that we want. We want to establish the supermind on earth. With my inner consciousness, I understood immediately. A few hours later, the creation was gone. And from that moment, we started anew on other bases. Amal Kiran explained why this great change took place. Instead of bringing down the great gods, the effort now was to start from the bottom, not from the top, to dig, as it were, into the subconscient and gradually prepare the purification of the human consciousness and nature and bring out what Sri Aurobindo had called the psychic being. Thus, the evolutionary creature would develop slowly, gradually, with a lot of hardships,
but still with a sure footing. Narayan Prasad, a disciple, gave us a glimpse of ashram life at that time. In the 30s, the atmosphere of sadhana was marked by a spirit of self-imposed discipline. Everybody was careful not to do anything that the mother might not approve of. That was almost the law that ruled our life. We knew only one delight, to sense what the mother would like us to do and then to act accordingly. The evening service in the dining room being over by sunset, hardly anybody could be seen in the streets except for some urgent work. Day and night were divided between work and rest, sadhana pervading both as far as possible. Nirodbaran recalled the day he arrived in the ashram. The simple beauty, purity and quietness of the atmosphere and the dedication of the sadhaks were emblematic of the soul's aspiration for the highest and impressed me deeply. For them, the mother and Sri Aurobindo were the highest incarnate upon earth. A.B. Purani gave an intimate account of one of the daily events at that time, the morning pranam to the mother. A major feature of the sadhana in those days was pranam. Each morning, the sadhaks assembled in the pranam hall, now called the meditation hall, and after the mother had seated herself, approached one by one and made obeisance. The mother looked deeply at each sadhak before and after he made pranam and gave him her blessings, sometimes by placing both her hands on his head. Before the sadhak left, the mother gave him a specially chosen flower. To the mother, each flower had a particular significance or power and could be used by her as a vehicle of her force. The whole purpose of Pranam was to give the mother an occasion to infuse her force into the sadhaks. At the same time, it gave them a chance to open themselves to her influence and to offer themselves to the Divine through her. The soup ceremony was a very important function every evening. At about eight, the mother would take her seat in front of a cauldron of soup and a small group of disciples. She would go into a trance. Amal Kiran, who was present, recollects, After some minutes, with her eyes still shut, she would spontaneously stretch out her arms and her palms were poised over the cauldron. For a minute, they would remain as if she were pouring something of her subtle physical spirituality into the liquid. After a while, her eyes opened and she withdrew her hands. Then, the distribution started. The occult truth behind the ceremony was that she was putting something of her own spiritualized, subtle physical substance into the soup, in our cups. During the late 1920s and early 30s, the mother sometimes went for car drives in the afternoon exploring the countryside around Pondicherry. Often, she invited a few disciples to accompany her. As Sahana Devi remembers, The mother, it seemed, knew quite well the paths we traversed. 
These walks were at times fairly long. Sometimes she would choose a spot and sit down and we would gather around her enjoying the scenery in the open. How pleasant it was with the mother. She carried with her some sweets and gave one to each. Here too mother often answered if anyone asked her a question. At times there was meditation. The balcony darshan of the mother, which became such an important part in the life of the ashram, started in an unusual way. As Sahana Devi recounts, For many years, from 1938, the mother could be seen on the north balcony adjoining Pavitra's room. She used to look towards the east before sunrise ere the morning was bright. One or two of the ashramites found this out and used to await her arrival on the balcony. Gradually, instead of the few who saw her there, the entire ashram came to get a glimpse of her and assembled on the street below. This came to be known as the Balcony Darshan. Later, even outsiders, visitors from abroad and also a number of people of Pondicherry too gathered there. At this darshan, the mother, after concentrating for a few minutes, used to sweep her eyes of benevolence over all who had come. This darshan came to end on the 8th March 1962. Flowers have always played a significant role in the ashram. Sahana Devi writes, The part flowers have played in the ashram has been quite unique, perhaps astonishing to an observer from outside. Flowers have always had a deep rapport with life lived here. Each flower was recognized by its inner vibration by the mother and named by her according to its significance. About flowers, the mother once said, I can repose my consciousness more easily in a flower than in a human being. Flowers have a wonderful capacity to assimilate. I transmit a part of my consciousness through flowers to everyone. It then depends upon the receptivity of the person concerned. In the early 40s, a few disciples arrived in the ashram along with their children to seek refuge from the perils of war. For these children and a few others already present, in 1943 the mother started a school and the ashram entered a new phase of its existence. Very early on the mother had written about a dream she had. There should be somewhere on earth a place where children would be able to grow and develop integrally without losing contact with their souls. Education would be given not for passing examinations or obtaining certificates and posts, but to enrich existing faculties and bring forth new ones. Sri Aurobindo said, Man is inwardly a soul and a conscious power of the Divine. 
and the evocation of this real man within is the right object of education. And indeed, of all human life, if it would find and live according to the hidden truth and deepest law of its own being. The mother herself was one of the first teachers. Her active involvement and guidance was the very foundation of the school, which gradually expanded to become the Sri Aurobindo International Centre of Education. The ashram continued to grow around the mother and her boundless energy and care. Every day she met the disciples, answered their questions, replied to their letters, appeared for the balcony darshan and distributed flowers. She also oversaw the growth of the various departments that took shape as the need arose. The mother herself played tennis and took keen interest in the sporting and cultural activities in the ashram. In the 50s, the mother played on her organ every Sunday. Music was for her a means of bringing down the higher consciousness from what she called the world of harmony. Her music became the source of inspiration for some disciples, notably Sunil. Between 1950 and 1958, the mother held classes for the children at the playground. Gradually, some disciples joined them as well. The mother would read some passages from Shurbindo's books, comment on them and answer questions, always trying to awaken the thirst for progress and the aspiration to live a truer and more conscious life. These answers were recorded and published under the title Questions and Answers. In April 1950, the renowned photographer Henri Cartier-Bresson came to Pondicherry. The mother granted him permission to take photographs. His unique photographs of Shurbindo and the mother were taken just a few months before Shurbindo left his body on 5th December 1950. During his lifetime, Sri Aurobindo endeavoured to bring down upon earth a new spiritual power he called the Supermind. The Supermind alone, he said, had the power to change humanity 
and transform terrestrial life. But for that to happen, the mother's physical presence was necessary. As Shurbinda wrote, Her embodiment is a chance for the earth consciousness to receive the supramental into it and to undergo first the transformation necessary for that to be possible. On 29th February 1956, the mother had the vision and experience of the manifestation of this new power and consciousness upon earth. She declared, My Lord, what thou hast wanted me to do, I have done. The gates of the supramental have been thrown open and the supramental consciousness, light and force are flooding the earth. Later, she explained, What has happened, the really new thing, is that a new world is born. Born, born. It is not the old one transforming itself. It is a new world which is born. There are people who love adventure. It is these I call, and I tell them this. I invite you to the great adventure. It is not a question of repeating spiritually what the others have done before us, for our adventure begins beyond that. One must put aside all that has been foreseen, all that has been devised, all that has been constructed, and then set off walking into the unknown, and come what may. As early as the thirties, the mother had dreamt about creating an ideal city. There should be somewhere on earth a place which no nation could claim as its own, where all human beings of goodwill who have a sincere aspiration, would live freely as citizens of the world and obey one single authority, that of the Supreme Truth. On 28th February 1968, under the Mother's inspiration and guidance, Oroville, a new city, dedicated to Sri Aurobindo, was born. The mother declared on this occasion, Auroville wants to be the bridge between the past and the future. Taking advantage of all discoveries from without and from within, Auroville will boldly spring towards future realizations. Oroville will be a site of material and spiritual researches for a living embodiment of an actual human unity. The dream is taking shape and people from around the world are coming together to take part in this unique experiment. Oh, 
le monde se prépare à un grand changement. Voulez-vous aider The world is preparing for a big change. Will you help? The mother beckons us to embark on this great adventure, the creation of a new world. Remember the mother, and though physically far from her, try to feel her with you and act according to what your inner being tells you would be her will. Then you'll be best able to feel her presence and mine, and carry our atmosphere around you as a protection and a zone of quietude and light accompanying you everywhere. The constant presence of the Mother comes by practice. The Divine Grace is essential for success in the sadhana, but it is the practice that prepares the descent of the Grace. You have to learn to go inward, ceasing to live in external things only. Quiet the mind, and aspire to become aware of the Mother's workings in you. The Mother is the goal. Everything is in her. If she is attained, all is attained. If you dwell in her consciousness, everything else unfolds of itself. The power that mediates between the sanction and the call is the presence and power of the Divine Mother. The Mother's power and not any human endeavor and tapasya can alone rend the lid and tear the covering and shape the vessel and bring down into this world of obscurity and falsehood and death and suffering. Truth and light and life divine and the immortal Sananda. Namaste, 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 Namaha, 